Welcome to the course on welding, cutting, and hot work. I am Marcus Wiesaw, your instructor for the course. And if you have any questions throughout the course as you move through the material, feel free to call me directly or email me, whatever is more convenient for you, and I'll try to respond and get some more information to you. My contact information is listed on the screen for that purpose. Let's go over the welding, cutting, and hot work objectives. There are four primary objectives I want you to be able to accomplish by the end of this course. Firstly, I want you to be able to list and describe the dangers of welding, cutting, and hot work. I want you to understand the duties and responsibilities of the fire watch. I want you to be able to identify cylinders that are improperly stored and name five hazards of welding operations. Hot work, fire, and explosive dangers. Workers performing hot work, such as welding, cutting, brazing, soldering, and grinding, are exposed to the risk of fires from ignition of flammable or combustible materials in the space and from leaks of flammable gas into the space from the hot work equipment. There are several precautions or basic precautions for fire prevention with respect to hot work. Performing hot work in a safe location and with fire hazards removed is of the utmost importance. We want you to always use guards to confine heat, sparks, and slag and to protect the immovable fire hazards if there are any. Do not perform hot work where flammable vapors or combustible materials exist. Work and equipment should be relocated outside of the hazardous areas whenever that is possible. Make suitable fire extinguishing equipment immediately available. This equipment can consist of pails of water, buckets of sand, a hose, or portable ABC fire extinguisher. And always assign a fire watch. The fire watch duties are pretty simple. The primary objective of having a fire watch is to have an individual there who can extinguish a fire, sound an alarm if a fire gets out of hand, and basically assist somebody else doing hot work with the uh, fire prevention initiatives. So the fire watch duties are to have fire extinguishing equipment readily available and be trained in its use. So a fire watch has to be trained and has to be competent in being a fire watch. The fire watch must be familiar with facilities for sounding an alarm in the event of a fire. The fire watch must watch for fires in all exposed areas, try to extinguish them only when obviously within the capacity of the equipment available or otherwise sound the alarm. For example, if we have a 20 pound ABC fire extinguisher, we know that we're limited to about oh, 30, 35 seconds of dry powder chemical for perhaps a nine square foot area. So something uh, requiring more extinguishment power than that would, would be caused to sound an alarm and a fire watch would know that. Uh, maintain the fire watch at least a half an hour after completion of welding or cutting operations or any other type of spark producing hot work to detect and extinguish possible smoldering fires. Atmospheric monitoring is sometimes required, especially if the hot work is going to be completed inside a confined space. And so we monitor with, usually it's a four gas monitor that we use, and we test the atmosphere inside confined spaces or wherever it's applicable. And we set the alarm, or usually they come stock right out of the box, with an alarm that's going to go off uh, at 10% of the lower explosive level or LEL and if the alarm does sound the work must be stopped. I do want to make a note here that sometimes uh, instead of lower explosive level or LEL you might be uh, inclined to see LFL which is the same thing and it means lower flammability level. Welding, cutting, and brazing. All hot work is potentially dangerous, and a hazard assessment should be performed to determine where hazards exist. Here are some potential hazards. Welding fumes, 
UV lights or ultraviolet lights, sparks, noise, and skinned injuries. Other hazards of hot work operations. Fire hazards, metal splatter, electric shock, explosion hazards, released gases, and radiant energy. There are three basic types of welding, gas arc and oxy and arc cutting. Gas welding is slower and easier to control than electrical arc welding. It uses a gas flame over metals until molten puddle is formed. The most popular fuels used with oxygen include acetylene, MAP gas, and hydrogen. Arc welding is where two metals are joined by generating an electric arc between a covered metal electrode and the base metal. And oxygen and arc cutting welding is metal cutting and welding is the severing or removal of metal by a flame or arc. The, there are best practices for welding, cutting, and brazing. And so what I'd like to do is go over a few common general industry best practices that are adopted and accepted throughout all different types of organizations. So firstly, we want to inspect the work area to make sure that all fuel and ignition sources are isolated by shielding or clearing the area, uh, lock, performing lockout tag out wherever that's necessary, and soaking flammable material with water. We want everyone, including the fire watch and the welder or, or whoever's performing the work, to wear appropriate personal protective equipment, such as a face shield, uh, leather welder's vest and gauntlet gloves. I uh, use cotton or denim clothing whenever possible. Uh, provide UV shielding for arc welding where practical for employee protection. We want to inspect welding and cutting equipment prior to use, especially for arc or gas welding or burning. We want to frequently leak test gas torches, gauges, and hoses. We want to review the hot work permit whenever that's required and make sure that everyone involved with the hot work understands the permit. Ensure the availability of adequate fire watch and fire protection equipment. Okay, one thing I want to make a note on is the fire watch is not considered a welder's helper. It's an easy but very important job and uh, the fire watch typically uh, is going to kind of stand around and make sure that uh, no fires uh, become started and if they do uh, the fire watch is going to go and extinguish those fires or sound the alarm and we kind of discussed the duties of the fire watch again and I want to make a note here that we didn't put the fire watch duty as go get the welder a sandwich go get the welder a tool or anything like that so we need to be very distinct on that because it's a frequently cited OSHA violation and uh, it's an easy one to comply with and to avoid. And finally, the last best practice is to ensure adequate ventilation from toxic welding and cutting fumes. Special hazards. There are special hazards that do occur frequently with welding, cutting, and brazing. Accumulation of toxic gases within a confined space is very common because usually tanks, silos, and, and other types of confined spaces can house different types of flammable liquids or toxic gases depending on what the use is of the tank. And so that is a special concern and special consideration that we must take when welding, cutting, or brazing in those kind of uh, work environments. A hazardous atmosphere exists in oxygen-deficient and oxygen-enriched environments. Now, OSHA has defined oxygen deficiency as an environment that contains less than 19.5% by volume of oxygen. Conversely, OSHA has considered and defined oxygen enrichment at an atmospheric concentration of greater than 23.5% oxygen by volume. So what we have here is we have a workable range. So if you measured the atmosphere now for oxygen content, you're going to come up with 20.9% or roughly 21% oxygen by volume. And so what we have here from OSHA's perspective is a range. We may work in an environment 
that has at least 19.5% oxygen, but no greater than 23.5% oxygen, both uh, concentrations by volume. And so when we do atmospheric measuring, like we discussed with the lower explosive limit, we will also get a readout from that foregas monitor on oxygen deficiency or oxygen enrichment. So in other words, it's going to give us a readout of what the percent by volume is. And if it's outside of this acceptable range, we have to either purge the system or find a way to uh, work in that environment that's both legal and safe. Possible solutions to these types of hazards include ventilating toxic metal fumes mechanically, uh, using a written permit system or hot work permit to document authorization to enter to do the work and uh, log the gas monitoring results uh, where there's the potential for toxic flammable or an oxygen deficient atmosphere. And I do want to make a note that you may use the confined space permit or or and or actually a uh, hot work permit. So you could use a hot work permit only or you could use a confined space permit only if you're going to be doing welding in a confined space. But nonetheless, just having some kind of written permit system is incredibly important. And it's a great step towards keeping everyone safe and avoiding unnecessary incidents and employee accidents. Cylinder storage. Cylinder storage is probably one of the biggest uh, violations that I see in almost every industry. So here's some good ideas on how to properly store cylinders. Ensure cylinders are properly stored in an upright position and chained in separate racks. Store full and empty cylinders separately. Uh, potential hazards include valve opening or breaking off, exposing workers to toxic fumes and flammable gases caused by improper gas cylinder storage. And one of the things I want to mention to you, it's kind of a fun thing. If you're familiar with that show called Mythbusters, uh, they did take an acetylene gas cylinder and they knocked the regulator off of it and addressed the myth of whether or not an acetylene cylinder will go through a brick wall. And what they found out was that it does. And so if you want to visit YouTube or go online and seek out that episode of Mythbusters, very interesting, very real, and I think it'll put everything into greater perspective for you on why storing cylinders, especially acetylene, is incredibly important. Cylinder storage best practices. Store cylinders in a dry, well-ventilated location. Avoid storing flammable substances in the same area as gas cylinders. Avoid storing cylinders of oxygen within 20 feet of cylinders containing flammable gases, such as acetylene. Store all cylinders upright and chained in separate racks, and store full and empty cylinders separately. So let's look at some photographs of improper storage. So as you can see here, we have different uh, compressed gas cylinders stored near each other inappropriately. Now if one of these were to tip over or if there were some kind of um, ignition source here we'd have a, a very big problem. Uh, here we see somebody working uh, and cutting possibly way too close to the bottles. Now we don't know if this is certain that these sparks will act as an ignition source. But is the potential there? Is there a possibility there? Yes, there is. Here we see a defective hose. I see this all the time. I can go into just about any welding shop, including colleges, schools, and uh, almost always find some kind of defective hose. One of the best preventative measures for uh, identifying defective hoses is just to simply inspect the hoses prior to use but most people don't want to take that extra step to do so. So let's look at some common OSHA violations just to wrap up this presentation. It's always better to look at some of this stuff especially with welding, cutting, and brazing so you can get a good idea of um, what's wrong and what's right. And so here we see improper storage. We see a bunch of compressed gas cylinders 
uh, basically tied together with one chain so we have we don't have a separation there that's required again we have uh, we have two uh, compressed gas cylinders or maybe three there that are chained uh, properly and we have this one closest to the sign that says flammable fire or flammable keep uh, fire away and that's not chained at all okay so that does have that particular compressed gas cylinder has no uh, has no protective chain around it to keep it from falling and here we see uh, a, an example of improper storage yet again of oxygen and acetylene being right next to each other here we see a bunch of compressed gas cylinders, again, improperly stored, uh, kind of bunched up in one location. And hopefully if your work environment looks like this, that this will help you say, hey, maybe we need to, to correct that. And if you need any help on that, just uh, let me know. Again, we, we see yet another example of a, a similar setting. So you can see that as we go through different organizations, it's, it's very common for compressed gas cylinders to be uh, stored improperly. And so it's incredibly common. And so if you need any help with that or want to know how to appropriately address that, uh, feel free to call or email me and we can discuss it further. And finally, this is one of my favorites. What we have here is we have a forklift operator who decided to move some compressed gas cylinders and you can see that we have uh, at least two there visible in this photograph uh, being uh, carried on a uh, looks like an extended boom forklift and if the operator were to uh, basically drop that it could become a rocket it could explode we could have a lot of different issues here and so uh, this is a handling and a storage issue and so very dangerous and uh, let's try to avoid things like that so nonetheless it's been a very thorough conversation on welding cutting brazing and hot work if you need help with anything or need further direction on say hot work permitting or if you want to know more best practices or anything else that I can help you with with respect to welding cutting brazing and hot work permits please let me know my contact information is listed on the screen there, and I hope you have a terrific day.